All right then. All right then. Welcome back to the. Uh... Hello there. There we go. Okay, yeah. Welcome back to the uh, randomized build playthrough for hey. Pillars of Journey. We are here in White Marsh Part Two. We are going to head back to town, get some rest after the various and sundry injuries that our characters have, and then we'll be heading to the uh, Iron Flail uh, encampment to deal with that and progress the plot. goal of the stream today is to kind of clear through uh, the White March Part 2 and uh, get as far as we can reasonably through the uh, Act 3, which you've already started a bit of. Perhaps it is time Have to stop ever looked up and reflect felt a on a sudden our day. surprise at where you are. I think it's just sunk in that I'm a year out from home. Only every day. You'll get used to it. Right, go take a rest. Back to warm your hands, eh? Top quality bear. Yes. We should talk to Khan over there. What do you need, of uh, What were you doing before you came I here? I hope to share knowledge with the monks of the Thousand Dreams. Their monastery lies east of here. They are said to be seekers of greater truth, like the Nalpazga. But if they still exist, I did not find them there. I want to know more about your beliefs. The ways of the Nalpazka can make little sense to an outsider. Uh, why had you eaten snowcap when we met? The Malkachoa? At any time, it is rare that I have <coughs> some. When you first try it, it seems a beautiful fantasy. You see colors you have never seen. Meet creatures that are not there. With practice, you see that all it does is oh. show you. Does that sneeze on uh, the essence the audio? Oh, God. of all things? Uh. How they are alike and connected. I have watched trees grow and will before me. I have tasted meat and known the animal's life as if it were mine. He leans in conspiratorially. But the Malkachoa often causes the stomach to empty with great violence. So it is not for everyone. Thank you for uh, that vocal break there, Zawa. When we met, you said you were freeing yourself from vanity. Vanity is a snare that roots us to the ground. The way we see ourselves, the way others see us, these things are not real. They cannot be touched. The Nalpazka teachings reveal many such snares. Fear, pleasure, doubt, hatred. They hold us back if we let ourselves be caught. And what happens if you can avoid being caught? Then you see only what is truly there, and you suffer no longer. You become as a god, seeing things as they do. Zawa speaks as one recalling a fantastic dream. If you can loose yourself from the snares, and you are free. Tell me about your scars. Zawa smirks. I meet people on the road and they pity me. I have come to find it endearing. They see so many scars and they wonder, how can the man beneath not be broken? He runs his fingers, or fingers over the puckered remnants of a gash on his left forearm. A scar is a wound that heals. A living reminder of our power over suffering. They cause no pain, only the echo of pain, which cannot hurt you. Show me a scarred man, and I will show you a man who can overcome. Who are the Nalpazka? We are the warriors of the Takan. Nobles, peasants, it does not matter. 
We are souls caged in flesh, nothing more. He knocks on his sternum. But it is one thing to say it, another to know it. So we train until we know it, or until we meet our ends. Zawa regards you a moment. I give this answer because it is what you wanted, but the Nalpazga would say different. They would say that we are nothing at all. What do the Nalpazga seek? Zawa studies the horizon. He smiles as if at a pleasant thought and does not look at you as he speaks. Perfection. He lets the word hang in the air for a moment, as though it were an invocation. Look around you. The world is perfect. Every being, every moment, every death. He frowns and shakes his head. Rarely do we see this. We stumble through life, lost in distractions. Every practice of the Nalpazga is a reminder to stop stumbling, to know the perfection. What do you practice? Our practices are suited to our enemies and things we hold to it to in fear of their opposites. Things like pleasure and vanity, even our own lives. How do you counter pleasure? We embrace discomfort. I knew an Alpazga, Tamin, who slept on sharp boulders and kept his arm raised above his head for two years. The arm withered. One day it fell limp and became useless. But always, it reminded him that pleasure and pain did not hold sway over his soul, and he became strong. What do you do against vanity? Vanity is my favorite. You have seen some of it. You must become loathsome, disgusting. The Takana used to our shit, but Deerwood has been far more enjoyable. A traveling noble offered his friendship to me as we crossed paths on the road. I blew my nose into his silken shirt sleeves, apologized, then vomited on his wife's gown when she expressed forgiveness. I was even beaten for it without having to ask. Work well done is truly its own reward. You have practices against clinging to life. Fear of death is our enemy, so we bury ourselves with our dead. We live on the carrion and meditate for days even as the worms burrow into our flesh. He curls his fingers like worms and presses them into his forearm in illustration, applying far more pressure than is necessary to make the point. When I completed my trial, my master had me placed at the bottom of a mass grave to make sure his point was clear. In time, you come to know death. You accept its beauty and its purpose. So it is with all our enemies. Let me ask you something else about your beliefs. Okay. <laughs> you would ask much of one who knows little. Where did you learn how to fight? Most Takan have two choices. They can grow crops, or they can become Nalpazka warriors. I was the youngest of five. A dreamer. The Nalpazka were always in my thoughts. They did not feel the same about me. Three times I tried to join their ranks. Three times I was refused. But they accepted you eventually. They had no choice. Our high priestess had a vision. Let me guess, Malkachoa? Malkachoa, plus some other shit, knowing her. <sighs> no one put on a better ceremony than she did. What did she see? She saw me as chieftain. Leading a host of Nalpasca warriors to victory over our enemies, the Quetchpatil. The last words twist his mouth as though he'd eaten something spoiled. Our last chieftain had died over the winter. A new one had not yet arisen from the Nalpasca. So the timing was right. The next day they brought me before Ishipilo, the great master of the Nalpasca, and I became his pupil. And this Ishipilo taught you everything you now know? You know now. I still trained with the other instructors sparred and meditated with my Nalpasca brothers and sisters. I learned from all of them. But learning from Ishipilo was a chieftain's privilege. He knew the secrets that could grant mastery over reality, invincibility in combat. When a Nalpasca was deemed a worthy successor to a chieftain, greater than all his peers, Ishipilo would take him in, prepare him for the future. I would not be as I am now, without his lessons. 
You said your teacher knew how to master reality. Did you learn his secrets? Zhao opens his mouth to speak, but only a slow exhalation escapes. He looks at you, frowning, and tries again. Not all of them. What was it your master never taught you? When I was brought to him, I knew how unworthy I was. But if he disapproved, he never showed it. In my shame, I gave him everything I had. He tutored me for seven years, and in that time, I became greater than the rest. Then the day came when he was to teach me the final secret of the Anitle. This is the unbeatable warrior all Takan chieftains must become to protect our people. Ishipilo never showed. I found him in his study, meditating. Or perhaps staring off. I couldn't say. Master, I said, is it time for me to learn to be the Anitle? Not yet, he said. And that was all. He never gave me another lesson. A year later, he was dead of old age. They named me Chieftain, anyway. You seem to have managed in spite of that. <laughs> have I? Maybe he was testing you? I thought so as well. I tried everything. Patience, rage, cleverness, acceptance. Not yet, he would say. Not yet. Someone else must have been able to teach you. At any time, two people know the secret of becoming the Anitle. The chieftain and the master of the Nalpazka. When Isipidal died, the knowledge was lost to us forever. <laughs> you would ask much of one who knows little. What happened after you became chieftain? Word of Ishipilo's death spread. Our enemies saw the opportunity. The catch model chieftain came with gifts to honor my rule. But his real purpose was to look me in the eye. To know if Zawa might be beaten. I looked at him, and I imagined that I was the Anitle, Free of all the worldly snares. That my master had taught me everything. When he turned to leave, I saw he wore a secret smile, and I knew I had failed. Three days later, they attacked. They were many times greater than our numbers. They had been trying to conquer us for generations, and the Takan chieftain had always sent them running. The power of the Anit lay. In my heart, I knew we would lose, and it would be because I was not the Anit lay. What did you do? What we had always done. I gathered my Nalpaska warriors and led a charge into the belly of their army. The Nalpaska believed Zawa was the Anatile, and it gave them strength. For their sakes for Takan, I believed it too. My mind found a place it had never reached before. I could see my enemies' moves before they made them. I could see my own actions in front of me, the path to victory. I did as I saw, and the catch model fell in heaps. And then the Kretschmanal chieftain came to face me, and he knew Zawa was not the Anatile. When I saw him, I knew it too. I hesitated. My enemies fell upon me one by one, the Nalpaska were defeated, and Takan was conquered. What became of your people? Zawa takes a slow breath. Of the men, they made slaves. Of the women, they made wives. Their way is to absorb the conquered, make them forget themselves. If Quetzmatal defeated you, how did you survive? They take you alive if you are a chieftain. They break your body and your spirit. Then they show you to their people and to yours, broken. After that, they cut off your head so that they may drink your soul from it. But you got out of it. Oh no, they did all of those things to me. They flayed me until my screams became whispers. Until I no longer knew who I was, and my only hope was to die soon. But they didn't stop, and that was their mistake. In my lowest moment, I released my grip on many worldly things I had come to embrace since my master's death. The pain made the world clear again. They brought me out to be executed, not knowing any better. They swung the machete down upon my neck, but it would not cleave. Each hack of the knife brought great pain, and the pain showed me glimpses of pure truth. For a moment in time, I was the Anatile. I broke my bonds by seeing beyond them.
I slew my executioner by knowing I would slay him. Were you able to free your people after that? All at once, Zawa seems to deflate. No. When the pain faded, so did my enlightenment. But it was enough to make my escape. I swore to return when my soul was ready to defeat the Ketch model. When I had rediscovered my master's lost secrets. You said you swore to return to liberate your people. Did you ever free them? No. I searched my empty homeland for any trace of Ishipilo's knowledge, but I knew he had left none. It would have been too dangerous. When that failed, I began searching the land to see if knowledge of the Anitle had come from abroad. I visited temples and monasteries. All the while, Zawa was trying to find the answer within himself as well. Meditation, Malkachoa, a thousand practices he had learned as Nalpazka, or dreamed on his own. He becomes nearer to the Anitle every day, but his soul is not free. He is not the Anitle. Is there any way I can help? Perhaps there is. In my journey to Stalwart, I passed through a place that put my soul on edge. I don't know what it was about that place, but I had intent to return there after I had fulfilled my pledge to Stalwart's mayor. The answers I search for now are of the soul, and such residents should not be ignored. I believe the local call the place Whitestone Hollow. It lies east of Stalwart. I would return there and explore its energy, if we should pass that way. Uh, what if you die without rediscovering your master's knowledge? Then the Dakan will be no worse off than they are now. But they do deserve better. Why not tr try to free them anyway, if you're close? The final step is the difference between invincibility and certain failure. Catch model has only grown over time, swallowed all its rivals. It would take no less than the Anitle to free and protect the Takan now. <laughs> you would ask much of one who knows little. Let's keep moving. So that... Hey does unlock a quest for us in Whitestone Hollow for Zawa's uh, personal quest. So let's go do that real quick. There is a spirit lion there, just ahead. Can you see it, Watcher? Zawa's wide, peopled eyes track the movement of some unseen animal. The lion was the symbol of my master, Ishipilo. This is a sign. Has he come here at last to teach me what he would not in life? To be the Anitle? What do you propose we do? I have some herbs prepared. Malkuchoa. Plus some things I've been saving. We should eat them so we can meet with the lion in its world. It would be my honor if you would come with me on this journey. A watcher may see things that I cannot. Very well. That goes for everyone. I would welcome the presence of friends. He pours a scattering of leaves and mushrooms into a cupped hand and holds them out for the others to inspect. Feels like we're back in the lore college. I'll try anything once. Bunch of times if it's good. Don't tell my kids. I can't believe you've been holding out on me this long! Are you ready? Yes, let's begin. Zawe distributes his mix of herbs, keeping a generous amount for himself. The plants give off a variety of strong, conflicting odors, some sweet, some acrid, and at least one that induces immediate sneezing. Their appearances are largely unfamiliar to you. You drop a handful of the mixture into your mouth and chew. The taste is dull and earthy at first. But within moments of chewing, it becomes powerfully sour, then sweet like nectar. Then it begins to take on a new character that's unlike anything you've ever eaten before. Your vision swims, and you see the world in a different, more vibrant spectrum. Zara takes one look at your expression and laughs. <laughs> you are ready. Hey. Do not let the lion escape us! Is that flower singing? 
No. Oh, stay focused, Zawa. A lone spirit hovers back and forth, agitated, muttering. I can learn from them, from their mistakes. Their failures have revealed the path to me, and I am very close. The spirit points to a scattered collection of maimed and contorted bodies distributed around a stone pedestal. Something odd registers in your mind about the corpses, and then the realization dawns. They all appear to be the same person. <laughs> I wouldn't be so sure. What are we getting close to? On that pedestal you see before you. The one with the bodies? Yes, the one with the bodies. As I was saying, on that pedestal you see before you, I placed a gem for safekeeping. You have never seen such a perfect gem. I regretted leaving it behind almost immediately. It has been my every waking thought ever since. I might be able to get it for you. The spirit seems to consider this. Wisps of essence dart in and out of its shape like bolts of electricity. That would be most welcome. Can't we watch him fetch it once? Maybe pick up some pointers? Why do you want it? It is all I have left of something that was important to me. Very important, by the look of it. Leave. Okay. Zawa is ready. What is this that so many have died to approach it? So just kind of... Oh. Let them flare up and die down. Were you able to retrieve the gem? Yes, I have it here. The spirit pulses excitedly with light and warmth. This is a great relief! Give it here! The spirit extends claw-like translucent hands toward you, cupped together, and when you let the gem drop, it passes through the spirit's hand and lands on the ground. Ah, clumsy. No need to worry, I've got it now. The spirit crouches to pick up the gem. It scoops at the gem, but cannot make contact with it. It does so over and over. This is a snare my master never told me of. How great... How subtle the hold of the past upon us. Let's keep moving. Hey. An old shaman hunches over a translucent table. Paint is streaked on either side of her eyes like flames. She casts an assortment of strange objects on the table. A finger bone, a cell guard tooth, a turtle shell. A few stones painted with symbols. She studies them over and over with disbelieving eyes. At last, she looks up. There is no mistake. The portals do not lie. Zawa, you will be our chieftain. You will succeed Ishapino and lead us to victory over the Ketchmaru. I will tell Ishapino that he must accept you. The path must be cleared for your reign. And we have a fight against an ice troll. Let's knock you down. Oh, it's a Milibus, it's an O and a Caster. Let's, uh, let's geek the caster first. Okay, take care of the will of the wisp while the ice troll is dominated. Uh, still focus will of the wisp, because they can do some confusion and daze bullshit. And take out the troll. Hey. Come on. Hey. Attack, folks. Still breathing heavily, Zara appears deep in thought. He notices your glance. The shaman's vision always stayed with me. After my master had passed, 
Even after the Takan were conquered, I thought of what the shaman had said and held on to hope. But I wonder if it did not also make me proud and foolhardy. If I ignored my own defeat because I did not believe it possible. The Takan aren't defeated yet. You're still here. Actually, no, this is a dive roll situation, I feel. Yes. Which is what I said anyway. Zawa has done his people no favors as chieftain, and the catch model would mock your words. But what you say is true, nevertheless. Hey. I should do a real quick check on the items for the soulbound. Okay, that's going to run along quite nicely. And I think that's the final level of it, too. Yeah, that's special. And you're going to find your way soon enough. Hey. So, let's continue on our way. There! I see it! An antelope stands gingerly on the muddy grass. Its fur is matted and stained dark around a deep oozing cash gash on its left haunch. Have you come here to eat me? Yes, we have. Zawa, I think I understand what this all means now. Quick, we have to eat it! Zawa shakes his head at Heravius, who tips his head downward, sadly. We are not here to eat you, but you are easy prey. Is there nowhere you can hide? The beasts of this place would catch my scent. I would not get far. But there may be a way I could be protected. A great tree grows to the north, whose sap has an odor that is repellent to predators. If you could draw this sap and rub it into my coat, I would be safe. I could heal and return to my herd. Where is this tree? To the north, beside a cave. You will not find a larger tree in the forest. Farewell. Galloway speed your steps. Hey. Of course. We are too late. The wolves have come. It was a mistake to leave the animal here, unprotected. We might have protected it for a while longer. We should not have left it. Perhaps you are right. But it is something we will never know for certain. In the end, though, the wolves would have come. They can smell weakness from great distances. We may have been bound for failure from the start. Hey. An unusually tall man with browned, leathery skin in a regal carriage bows to Zawa. Chief Aurelia, why are you here? I come on behalf of the Ketchmaster to pay you tribute, great chief. Tendons bulge at the size of Zawa's neck and his fists are clenched. For the first time since you met him, he appears on the brink of losing control. He speaks through gritted teeth. You have come to see if I am ready to protect my people. The Kretschmatala chieftain smiles, bearing glistening teeth. Well, are you? Okay. Okay, so he's basically a spirit-shifted wolf. Huh. 
Zara contemplates the, bow the body of his enemy. When the catch model chieftain saw me, he knew I was not prepared to resist him. If I had been more convincing, I have always believed they would not have attacked. Okay. Agreed. A bit of deception might have kept you safe. For a time, perhaps. But looking back, I was mistaken. We were always the prey. Never the predator. This was the life of the Takan. We lived knowing that one day the wolves would come. And finally, the day came when we were wounded and could not escape them. Hey. Water flows from a pool at your feet upward onto the rocks above, as though time itself were flowing in reverse. It sounds more like a stream than a waterfall. Examine the water. The column of water is clear and pure. Its flow is steady, but not torrential. Other than the direction of its course, it seems ordinary. Okay, let's keep exploring. Did you see where it went? Hagrid, a man. This man's face is weather beaten, and his eyes are sunken deep into his skull. His body is scarcely more than a string of bones. He speaks with great effort, his voice dry and grainy. You... will you help me? Water... from the waterfall, please. Why from the waterfall? Why not from the pond? The man shakes his head sadly. It appears to be the same in every way, but alas, it only makes my thirst greater. Only water from the waterfall will do. I wish it were not so. I can carry you over to the waterfall, then you can drink from the source. I have tried, but the water eludes me. I open my mouth, and it falls only on either side. I place cupped hands beneath and pull them out dry. Only the first time was I able to taste it. Never have I tasted anything so pure. Ever since, I have not been able to bring myself to leave. I wish only to taste it once more. That would be enough. I'll see what can be done. He nods and thanks, and offers your water skin lying beside him. You will need this to collect the water. I will be forever grateful. Gather some water in the water skin. You place the skin in the water and invert it, filling it steadily. Almost immediately, the water around your hand begins to roil and hiss. You feel an excruciating, burning pain as the water begins to eat away at the skin on your fingers. Resist the illusion. This place boasts powerful illusions, and you are sure this is one of them. You cling to that knowledge, and the certainty has that none of it is happening. For a moment, the illusion holds. You hold the water skin in place, despite the agony in your fingers. Skin gives way to flesh, and then to bone. But in the face of your surety, the enchantment quickly weakens. The pain fades, and for one moment to the next, the ghastly image of your hand melting is gone. The water skin is quite full, and you are able to draw it away without further incidents. When you go to replace the stopper, something strikes your hand from below, having been carried upward by the waterfall. Wildfowl's current. It drops into the pool. You reach down to where it fell and withdraw a handful of jewels, pure and blue as the waterfall itself. Hey. Have you had any success? We were able to capture some water, yes. <laughs> Wonderful! I've waited so long! His fingers tremble with excitement as he closes his hands around the stopper and slowly twists it. 
The stopper comes free suddenly and flies from his hands, propelled by a violent burst of steam. Oh no! Oh, oh. He upends the water skin, holding it above his lips, but not a single drop that falls. He shakes it, twists it, squeezes it all to no avail. The water is gone. Given his history, I am surprised he had not foreseen this possibility. He longs not for the water, but for the experience of first tasting it. He is bound for disappointment. His suffering is very pretty, yet it feels empty. What value does it have if he refuses to learn from it? Can he not see that he seeks something that can never be recovered? Ishapilo sits meditating. He opens his eyes and looks at Zawa. Hello, pupil. You come to me with a question, do you not? <coughs> he coughs, dry as desert sand. Zawa stares at him, his mouth quivering faintly. Yes, Ishapilo. I have sought your wisdom across many lands, over many years. Are you here to grant it to me? Yes, pupil. I am here for you. Zawar nods, draws a deep breath. Our people are captives of the catch model. I need to know the secrets of the Anitle. Of, of course. The answer has been with you the whole time. You are blind not to <laughs> He should pillow breaks down into a coughing fit. As he coughs harder, granules of dust fly from his mouth and plumes. Master, please, I cannot hear you. Zawa studies him by the shoulders, but Isapilo coughs only worsen. Dust pours from his lips by the mouthful. Answer me! Zawa's hands tighten around Isapilo's frail body. He shakes Isapilo, but the coughing continues. He shakes him again. In, Z in Zawa's hands, Isapilo turns to dust. It scatters instantly to the winds. Zawa looks at the dust on his hands, holding them cupped as if to preserve some vital piece of his master's wisdom. Despite his best efforts, the winds carry off the remains, leaving him with nothing. He frowns. Even after his death, I have always felt that when the time was right, Ishapilo would find a way to teach me his secret. And yet here we are on his trail, and his knowledge is no less a mystery to me. Is this what I am meant to see? That his teachings will always be beyond me? Perhaps it's time to let them go. Zawa has been looking since he was a young man. If he were to end that search empty-handed, what would he do then? Zawa shakes his head and smiles bitterly. I have been caught in a snare, worrying over things that could not be changed. These visions shame me with their truths. Ishapilo never warned me of this, but I should have seen it sooner. I have become a slave to knowledge I will never learn. I have denied all my failures. Yet, I feel no different, no freer than I was. There is something I am missing, even now. This may be our answer. Let us see what has hey. been uncovered. You must you come must with come me at once. once. Zawa, Zawa, you should not be here. If you are you caught, they will execute you, and they will, and they will not, not fail twice. I do not, I do not care, care about my life, Namaltia. I come, I come to liberate the Takan. We will we unite and revolt. revolt. And who will you unite? Our men are dead or broken. Their labors were too cruel. Our women are mothers to catch model children now. The Takan live only in your mind. Zawa stands in silence, staring where the apparitions had been. Who was that woman? She was a Nalpasco warrior. Eldest daughter of the shaman. She was would have been the wife of the Takan chieftain if the Takan had not fallen. Did that really happen? Some years ago, 
Zawa considered that he might never learn Ishipilo's secret, but he had vowed to return to his people. And so he did. He journeyed to catch Mato, and while their warriors were off raiding, he spoke to the surviving Takan he found there. What was that about? An argument Zawa had with someone once. His jaws clenched. Nothing came of it. He never told me. For once, Zawa seems unable to meet your gaze. Zawa has never spoken of it to anyone. His face is tense, his skin lacking its usual smoothness. He looks old. He waited too long in returning. If there was a time to liberate his people, it passed long ago, while he searched for the secret of the Anitle. There had to have been something you could have done. This has been my thinking all these many years. But I see now that I was caught in this snare. The gem, the antelope, the waterfall. Their lessons were not about Ishipilo's secrets. They were about my vow to return to the Takan. He is quiet again. His eyes search the ground, then seem to fix on something. You look down, but see only a small worm burning into the earth near his feet. He sneers in that direction for time, then slowly he looks up at you. The time of my people has ended. There is nothing more I can do for them. The culture of the Dakan and the Nopalska warriors still exists within you. You can still carry it forward. Their time on Aora was too brief. There is much the rest of the world might have learned from them. Much that I might yet share. Sawa looks around and smiles flatly. The dream fades around us. I believe it is time to return. The brilliant colors around you seem to dull, shifting objects settle into their true forms. Zara appears the same as he always has, the same shredded skin, the same fluid posture. Only the look in his eyes has changed. Zawa was granted Anatile. Zawa so is ready. That is a little uh, ability he has, or talent, yeah. So it's uh, just a plus in attack speed for him, which is very nice. Hey. Okay, and with that side quest done, we will head to the Iron Flail Fort. Of course. Well, it looks like they want to fight. Here in prayer bracelets. Hmm. Hey. Let's go into scouting. Let's see mode. what lies this way. Okay, that is a dead wizard. Hey. I would say that's a cipher, typically. But how are folks doing tonight? All right, then. Ooh, and a young polar bear. 
And a caster, which we can take out post haste. Sneak through this little northward passage. Here, I brought you a scarf. <laughs> Thanks, Mariel. I can explain, but wait, who are you? You're the Lord from Cadnua, aren't you? The woman's cheeks are rosy with embarrassment. What are you doing here? Are you here with that army? Uh, no, no, we're just villagers. Lie to me again, and I'm going to hurt you. Please, j l let's keep it down. Alec may be asleep on duty, but he's not the only one around. Gun sorting with the enemy. No need to be so dramatic. We weren't. We aren't hurting anyone. Besides, Gamel has been pretty reasonable. Reasonable. Farewell. Take care. Now, where were we? Hey. I'll take a look. Ooh. Uh, just a ring of overseeing. Observing it from below, you notice that the watchtower at the side gate appears to be unmanned. You find no hostile faces peering over the fence either. The roof of the tower crosses the fort walls. Climbing it may provide a means of getting inside. At this hour of night, you see, with the chill rolling in, most of the noise within the camp is concentrated by the campfires. A discreet individual could take the opportunity to climb over and open the gate without raising the alarm. Examine the gate. Uh, looking over the outer wall, you notice two posts which have come a little loose from the moorings, forming a gap. While the gap might be too small for larger kith, you suspect that you might just be able to squeeze past. Squeeze the gap! You clamber up toward the gap in the post. After a good deal of squirming, you manage to get your torso past, and the rest follows. You get your first glimpse of the camp, surrounded by in the evening gloom, and of the guard posted some short distance away. A moment's observation reveals that the man is snoring, deep asleep. You creep forward to unbar the gate. Hey! I shall be quiet as a calm sea, which is not very quiet. One of the benefits of actually having a fairly decent stealth amongst the uh, party members. Holy shit, this might be the first time I've reached this main tent without incident. It is! Enough! I've had my fill of... What's this? What? Who are you? The Iron Flail Commander is a younger man, lean in build. His brown hair is unkempt, his eyes fevered. At the feet, at his feet is a grate, set over what appears to be a pit. You hear a smattering of anxious cries rising from the cell as the commander steps forward. He clears down the f through the gates, face a mask of rage. More of your scheming friends. Not a scrap of honor in the lot of you. I prefer to settle this peacefully. I'm sure you would. Now that you're here, you want to talk? 
Set down your... Adex words die in his throat, his expression frozen mid-snarl. It isn't clear what's happened, not until you start to feel it, too. Unbidden, your senses drift, as if you had reached out towards a source of essence. You feel an ache in your chest, an almost painful sensation of being pulled forward. A sudden wave of memory floods your mind. Clear as this day they formed, you see Odema's campsite ravaged by the Beowak, the halls of Cadnua. You tread wet cobblestones beneath Copper Lane, seeking the leaden key. You climb winding steps to the top of a tower that parts the clouds. The image washes over you, tracing lives and emotions from a hundred different times and places. Not all are your own. Slowly, you become aware of the sensation of being watched. Break away. You rest yourself free from the soul rending reading, throwing back into your own salty awareness. Nearby, Adric looks startled, his face ashen. Huh! That's never happened before. You're... you're the Watcher at Cadnua? They said he was a senile hermit. Marewald is dead. Cadnua is mine now. Why have you come? Why now? Okay, Dice, let's see if you decide violence. You did not this time. I came to find out what happened to the delegates. All this for them? Oh, more chances. Infiltrating my fort, skulking through the camp. Why did you imprison these people? Stalwart sent delegates to discuss terms of peace. I offered them the opportunity. I was generous. But Stalwart sent soothsayers, not diplomats, to frighten us with stories of the moon going dark, the earth shaking. I would speak to the people who have seen these wild visions to <clears throat> compare notes. A shrill voice suddenly rises up from the pit. Adric stomps down angrily on the bars, drowning her out. I see there's no convincing you. Cut him down, men. We'll send his head back to Stalwart. All right. That's the violent dice I know. Okay. So I will send a deer in just to be a line there. Since I'm here, have you go cat mode. Have our ranged line target the wizard, and then we'll follow up with the uh, priest. Okay, priest is down. Okay, they're down. Focus the champion on that end. I dare use one of your knockdowns on Patrick. Leave it to me! Okay, he is down. Target the archer. This one was no good to me. Okay, the champion is dominated, so let's just target the archer. Okay. Time to take out the champion. Clarence Wong was granted Sever the Soul. The Watcher targets the very essence of a creature with their next attack, bypassing the target's defenses and leaving them weakened. Huh. That's actually pretty nice. All considered. Hey. Okay, that is Steadfast... Which can be equipped to anyone. Hey. 
Hey. Quick and quiet. Okay. Let's just go through scouting mode real quick. Take these items before freeing the prisoners. Also want to just check my soulbound items real quick. Okay, coming on quite nicely. There will, many of those will be resolving themselves soon. This one is going to be with us for a while. Hey. Oh, thank you. I thought we'd never get out of there. You're lucky I was in the area. Don't we know it? I am not sure I could stand another night in that pit. Abaddon, bless your blade. I thought that madman would kill us all. The commander wasn't the problem. One of the delegate points an accusing finger at another, a woman standing apart from the rest. Uh, we might have come to terms if she hadn't goaded him, shouting at him about omens and curses, demanding he leave the march. You know he, he how superstitious the raid sarens are. The commander went white as a sheet. She sabotaged the meeting. The woman is in question is dressed in unassuming robes. She bears the accusation silently, her eyes closed, as if in prayer. Who are you? With desperate speed, the woman suddenly lunges sidelong towards a nearby wreck and seizes a dagger lying there. She sets the blade to her own throat. Unseen to all but yourself, the dying woman's soul essence coils in thin wisps around her body. It only grows brighter as her corpse tells. The remaining delegates stare in horror at her pooling blood. Uh, what just happened? Damn it! Now we'll never get an answer out of her. You reach out, embrace against the sudden flare of pain and fear, digging after less recent events. There's a copper taste in your mouth and a pain-like fire in your throat. Under the brute terror of death, you find a comforting threat of resolve, of satisfaction and duty fulfilled. You follow it. It leads you stumbling into another memory. As whole and vivid as the first, you walk the dark halls of the abbey, dimly lit and quiet, your footsteps loud. A blur, and you are standing in a dimly lit room, facing a robed am Amawa. You recognize him as Kato, the high abbot. He beckons you forward. You are in a wide, round chamber. The tiles beneath your feet are covered in strange, curling symbols. You recognize them as symbols of Andra, goddess of sea and memory. The memory blurs. When your sight is clear, you are standing in front of Kato, and he is smiling gently down at you. Drive the Raid Series from these mountains, and you may yet spare many lives. The Tidebringer will be here in a week's time. Should you be delayed in your travels, report to him as you would to me. He will enter the reliquary and call off the army of Ilus in my stead. If you are caught, sister, you know what you must do. I will pray for your return, but we will take comfort in the knowledge that you have joined the rest of Andra's favorite in her keeping. The words draw you loose from your memory, flinging you back into the moment of the woman's death, and then into your own skin. But traces of her memory joins yours, and you know the path to the abbey to which she was returned, buried in the mountains to the north. She was sent to drive out the Red Sarens. Well, yes, weren't all, we all? I don't think that's what she, he means. Sent by who? Never mind that. Do you know what a Tidebringer is? Tidebringer? That's something they used to talk about at the Temple of Andre, I think. It's a person, a title, I mean. It tends to be used in a more, uh, devout circles. Do you know a Kato? Kato. Oh yes, he came through town some time back, stopped by at the temple in Stalwart. This was just after the town decided to rededicate it to Abaddon. He didn't seem too pleased about it. He was dressed like a priest. Maybe he took offense. 
He's an Amawa, a tall fellow, very polite, considering he's apparently the leader of some fanatical sect. I think it's clear we haven't been the best judges of Kirit recently. What about the Eyeless? Have you heard of them? The Eyeless? They're a figure of speech, for when you can't rem rem remember something, you say, Must be the Eyeless took it from me. Yes, yes, there, but there's a story to it. They were supposed to be doing the bidding of the Lady of Lament. Andra points and they come, out of nowhere. Wipe things from the face of the world. That's why whenever something up and goes missing or gets destroyed or with no one there to see it, you're supposed to thank Andra that the Eyeless didn't come for you too. Do you know anything about the Abbey to the north? I've heard of something like that, an Andrite stronghold. Not the kind of place that welcomes visitors. Is that where she came from? Yes, and it's where I'll find the reliquary so I can call off their army. What, another one? Guz, I feel like everyone on Aeor is after the battery now. Why would these Andrites want the Red Sarens out? I doubt it's for Stalwart's benefit. Competition, maybe? Looks like I did their work for them. If you do mean to go to the Abbey, be careful. There have been stories about traitors wandering north and getting scared off or even killed by st the strange guards. The secret of Bunch. I suppose you could try a sneak in. I doubt you'll be welcome otherwise. It sounds like the Tidebringer would be welcome, I mean. Skulking around isn't really my style. Well, you'll get your fill of fighting, I'm sure. A sudden, deafening crash from outside makes the delegates jump. Startled, a rumbling like thunder follows. You hear f further sounds of smashing timbers, panicked screaming. Gods have mercy, what is it now? Shrug and walk away. Well, yes, well, we're right here. Uh, inside. Hey. Hey. Hmm. Skulls from Mother. Somewhere in deep in the ruins of Ibril's well, a pair of prega prey on travelers and offer up sacrifices to their mother. In the past, travelers simply knew to avoid all trails leading near the well, but in recent years, the Prager haven't faced the range of their hunts. Travelers have been abducted or killed on the roads between Solace Vale and Midwood. Glan Fathens are reticent to enter Ibrael's well due to the religious significance of the ru ruins there, but that hasn't stopped the residents of the affected towns from requesting help from within the Deerwood. Aeloth. Uh, yeah, we'll send Aeloth. Hey. Oh my god, it's the eyeless. And they are tough oh, sons of bitches. So they are quite tough. Four. Honestly, uh, Wydron's Redeemer being able to just destroy vessels is one of the best things we've ever done. As the last Megfolk falls, a tide of essence sweeps through the aether. It washes over you, and you find yourself in the memories of the Eyeless. The hulking creatures surround you, their sinew-wrapped skeletons clanking and screeching in the semi-darkness. Their bodies fill the air with a tank of metal and the musk of sweat. The cavern in which you stand, it looks like a cavern anyway, glows with a dim ambient light. Steel flashes as the Eyeless shift and stir. They stamp their feet and groan in rasping, metallic voices. Their restless energy prickles at the back of your neck. And in the echoing rumble, you hear something familiar. It's the pounding noise from your dream, the harbinger of a terrible army. You begin to wonder how many Eyeless are crowded around you. You suspect there must be scores of them, maybe more. It's difficult to tell how far back the shimmer goes, or where it is. Ahead, you see a glint of light. It might be an exit. Already, however, the vision starts to fade. 
investigate the glint of light. You push past the eyeless, the lumbering eyeless, and cling to the wilting shreds of the vision. The light up ahead is blinding after the dark of the cave. You rush toward it even as it fades into a pale blur. You can't see where you are, but you hear a cold wind whistling through the gap and feel a spray of moisture stinging your cheeks. The vision ends, returning you to the frozen and blood-churned mud of the fort. Like taking a hatchet to a mountain. But we've done it all hey. the same. It's a lot of vessel flesh and a lot of binding copper. Hey. And that was uh, enough turns completing that quest to complete uh, Skulls from Mother. Eloth explored the ruins of Ibrel's well extensively and found a wide array of dangers in the ancient city's crumbling homes and palaces. Though the Prega had always been hostile to outsiders, Eloth was able to speak with them and realized that they were being mentally controlled by someone else. The source of the increased attacks was an Orland cipher who had been disowned by her father and subsequently banished from the Twice Split Arrows. Especially skilled at mental domination, the cipher was using the Prega, her children, to make a small fortune on unlucky travelers. However, once Adoloth drew her out into the open, the overconfident cipher was quickly defeated. In the cipher's lair near the heart of Ibrel's well, Adoloth discovered a grisly treasure, a necklace the Prega had formed from the teeth of the Orland's murdered father. And we have Father's Teeth, Grant's Fraught Skulls, for charges and 18 fortitude, plus 18 fortitude. Hey. Okay. So, yeah, got two of those in. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Hey. So I am going to just kind of loot the camp because it's there. And I'm going to check out the rest of the map, just for the sake of completion. Tell me look in experience-wise. Okay, getting close to level 14. Oh, I'll a lock we can back. actually pick. Go wrong. All done. Okay, so let's head off the map.
trying to think here. And yeah, let's head to Stormwood Village. So I'm going to head to the inn and against some of my better judgment I'm actually going to switch out a Zawa for a Maneba, the Barbarian, because her personal quest is actually at the uh, Abbey of the Fallen Moon. And I want to keep Adair and Heravius in the party, just Heravius with his lightning and cat form is just too good to pass Back to warm up. Your hand, Jay. And Adair's a good you? tank, plus I have Wide Winds Redeemer on him. Very well. Okay, you awaken and hear someone stirring, growling. Looking over, you see Maneha twitching and muttering in her sleep. You can't make out what she's saying, but her, from her bard's teeth and the sheen of sweat on her brow, she this seems like a very bad dream. Wake up, Maneha. <laughs> Calm down yourself. What? Oh. Her gaze darts around, but slowly focuses on you. She grimaces and looks away, wiping her face. Oh, sorry. I must have been dreaming. You can't help but notice how carefully she's avoiding your gaze. About what? No, it's nothing. Sorry, I, I shouldn't have bothered you. You aren't bothering but me, but clearly something's bothering you. I'd like to help. She's quiet for a long time. It seems like she's already gone back to sleep, but then she sighs. You told me about your awakening. Adair stirs. Maneha waits silently until Adair rolls over and resumes deep, steady breaths. I guess I've had a similar problem. There's something I remember from a former life. Happened hundreds of years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. How did you remember it? Happened while I was fighting in Old Valia 20 years ago. My unit was camped out in the palace we'd just taken. The others were roasting the last of the Marchesos pigs in the feast hall. So, I went to the wine cellars to fetch a few bottles. I don't know how long she'd been hiding there, but there was this old woman. Must have been one of the servants. She had this wild look in her eyes. I approached her and tried to tell her not to be afraid, that she was safe. She screamed and grabbed my arm. It felt like someone had hit me in the back of my head. I blacked out for a few minutes, and when I came to, she was gone. Go on. I took a few bottles up with me, feasted with the rest of the troops. But when I went to bunk, I had a dream. Only it was more vivid than any dream I've ever had. I tasted the sweat on my lips, felt the jungle air on my skin, heard the cries. The stream. This was a memory. Like when you hear a song you know you've heard before. Anyway, I laid off the drink for several days, but I kept having the dream. After a few weeks, I, I thought a change of scenery might do me good. Since then, I've been a pirate in the Deadfire. A pilgrim in the White that wins. An adventurer in the Living Lands. And a gift bearer in a shamatal. What's next, then? I told you I was looking for the Abbey of the Fallen Moon so I could leave something behind. There's a pool there, the Salt Well. It's where gift bearers leave the heaviest burdens. It's said that a person can enter it and leave their own memories behind. And you will leave this haunting memory in the Salt Well? That's the plan. But if you lose more than you intend? (laughs) At this point, I'd gladly give up all my memories if that's what it takes for peace in this life and the next. Let's get some rest. We've got a lot to do. Okay, so let's get her leveled. We have a few of these to go through. So we have her mechanics. Only two of those can take the four. Okay, so talent. It's going to be a utility talent. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 2. Arms bearer. Whoa. 
Okay, skills for level 11. Only four can take the six. That's survival. Barbarian abilities. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Bloodthirst. After killing an enemy, the barbarian's recovery is waived, allowing them to attack again immediately. Not bad. Level twelve skill. Athletics. And the element that can take the forest, the athletics. Talents. It's a class talent. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yep, thirteen. So we'll already twenty. Thirteen! Veterans recovery. Okay. By adopting the strict discipline of a fighter, the character is able to pace themselves in combat, suddenly beginning endurance over time. to give her these two. So it's just an exceptional sword that gives plus five will and plus one resolve. Needs to kill at least five enemies with stat fist with critical hits to unlock the next level. And this one, it's a medium shield, decent deflection, uh, Grants the bash ability and has to do at least 300 damage to enemies above 75 endurance with bash to unlock the next level or 15,000. 15, 1,500 in total. Oh, might as well read the descriptions. Steadfast is a single edged back sword with a recurved guard and wire wrapped grip. Though not especially fancy, the crafter skill is readily apparent to any who hold the weapon in their hands. And Dragon's Maw Shield. This shield was traditionally passed between dragon hunters to honor exceptional feats and skills. Receiving the Dragon Maw Shield is one of the highest honors among dragon hunters, and over the years, it's been the object of countless bets, soured friendships, lifelong apprenticeships, and violent deaths. And that's only DR7. Let's see what else we can get, yeah. Oh, that's good. Just looking for a uh, potential items to give her. Yeah, a combination of these will probably do. Oh. Hey. Ah, oh, howdy there. Good to see some more folks in chat. More viewers. Hope you all have a good night now. We are playing through uh, part two of uh, the White March. About to head to uh, 
the Abbey of the Fallen Moon. Hey. So, you said the Eyeless came from the Abbey. I'd heard rumors of the Eyeless, but I always thought that name was a metaphor. Though, I would have called them Mace Hands of Doom, if anyone had asked me. Not non-committally. So, this is the mysterious army you've been dreaming about, huh? It's a wonder you're getting any sleep. That's why we're going to the Abbey, to stop them. <sighs> I'm regretting all of my decision-making up to this point. Still... I guess a suicidal plan is better than none. Don't worry, we'll find the salt will too. I know, it's just... Uh, well, knowing that I'm finally close to getting rid of this memory, it, it feels like it's crowding my head that much more. She paces and locks her fingers into her hair. It's been with me for decades. Driven me halfway across the known world. Perhaps you need to get it off your shoulders. <sighs> You're right. It was a war, centuries ago, before Adirin unification. I was a soldier then. Led a campaign across the northern forests to subdue some of the outlying Kalkland villages. Brutal work. Go on. Lost a third of my forces to the forest, and another third to the elven scouts hiding in it. By the time we reached the first village, we'd crushed their defenses, and they'd bled us. Wasn't much more than children and the elderly left. But they spit on us when we marched into town. The village elders surrendered and offered us lodging in the old meeting hall. And when the sun set, they tried to burn it down around us. They barely got a flame going, but that wasn't the point. What was it? In their defiance, I saw months more of pointless, bloody battle as we fought for the rest of the region. I had to break them. And I had to send a message to the rest of the villages. So I nailed every last one of them to the trees around the town and left them there to die. That wasn't you, uh, Maneha. So I've tried to tell myself. Anyway, we should get going. So basically, you went the full Nipton. All right. Hey. A dwarf, clothed in but a few straps of fur, puffs his bared chest with every drag from his pipe. Come a long way to get some air, have you? What are you doing here? Enjoying the fine weather just a bit longer. He smiles, letting a cloud of smoke and frosted breath escape through his teeth. My mistress has business with the Andrites. We'll be off soon, as she's done at the Abbey. Meanwhile, I was told to stay put. They don't want any outsiders meandering about. She already put some kind of hex on me, says I won't even remember any of this, but the copper is worth it. She says I'll wake up at home with a full coin purse, opposite of most of my mornings, so that has certain appeal. Tell me about your mistress. Which one? He lets out a chuckle and stops his chest. A reddening print of blossoms on, blooms on his skin. Wish she were the fun kind. She's a gift bearer. Paid me well to guard her on the journey, though. What are you doing here? My mistress has business with the Andrites. Uh, yep. Uh, that again. I'm looking to get inside. Are you now? He pulls the pipe away from its clenched teeth and points it to... The it's long stem to the path ahead. For as I know, straight this way. The middle path on the right with the ruined arch. If they let you in, of course. Andrades are known too friendly, but to their own. My mistress went through the archway, spoke to some guards there, and headed on. They've got eyes on the other paths. Cast me dirty looks from afar when they pass this way. That's why I'd stand here in plain view if I had some grand designer sticking to the blazing church. And what's an abbey got that's worth hiding anyway? Monks? Do you know of other ways into the abbey? No, but it's an abbey, not a fortress. You can bet it's got holes, like any fat old monster. Supply passages, escape routes. 
I'd be lying if I said I've never explored one uninvited when I was too young to know better, helped myself to his relics. Let's just say if a certain war goddess has her way, I'd be living my next life as a dung roll bag. Bug. Why are you helping me? You gotta look about you, like you need it. And maybe there's something I don't like about this place, like it's hiding something. My younger days, I'd be more going in there. Farewell. That will meet again. Any luck? My mistress will return soon. Hope you find what you're looking for. So let's head up into the abbey. Lots of ways into this dungeon. Hard to imagine a whole sect living out here. But I guess that's the point. I don't think I've ever actually tried to just walk straight in with uh, Maneha. Which hypothetically she could do. Hold. Who's there? Kato is waiting for me. I am the Tidefinger. The guard's eyes narrow. How can I be sure? You don't get many visitors, do you? Who else would choose to come here but the Tidebringer? The guard relaxes and appears relieved. Forgive my caution. We were told to expect you. The High Abbot awaits you inside. Kato knew Simon was upon us. The Tidebringer. It's been so long. My soul is ready, brother. So they let you through. You must be our visitor. So the high this place reminds me of a decaying Straight deer back. carcass, which is making me hungry. So yeah, there's a pretty big ribcage here. Oh, look, there's a, uh, there's a nice lake, as you can see on the loading screen. craftsmanship that gave form to you the statue appears too tainted. skilled and refined to come from you will mere find the hands. abbot past the chamber of the fallen moon behind me mmm smells fresh that can't be the salt well he seemed preoccupied and honestly there are Parts of this design that does remind me of the uh, Aura Light Temple in uh, Icewind Dale 2. When the other, when the other Andrites in the Abbey are clad in drab, functional garments, this somehow seems dressed for an occasion. His rib is bright and glossy, his neck and arms are bedecked with jewelry. The symbols of his goddess are, crowned into every, are crowded into every available space. Ah, good. The Conclave has elected a Tidebringer after all. I had begun to worry. He looks back up, noticing your company, and nods. And they took my advice in providing you an escort. Very good. I am sorry I could not make your journey easier. I am Kauto, the High Abbot. Oh, let's see if the dice choose violence once more! They do not. I came as soon as I could. And just in time. The May Queen's tide is nearly past its peak. Much longer, and we'd have had to wait another year. The rules of the Rising are quite clear on that, unfortunately. When you are ready, we will begin with the recitation. Farewell. Our library is open to you, as are the grounds outside. There is a beautiful mural out there that you should see, if you haven't yet. And you may, of course, speak with the gift bearers here, if it helps your recollection. Take your time and examine these things before your recitation. Okie dokie. So let's do some exploration. Smells like an ocean breeze. We've got to be close. Okay, we don't have the mechanic skills to pick that. They call out sometimes. 
Even the guards below think it's strange. For Andra, most like. They surely long for her embrace. It's here. The salt well. In the room is a pool. It's small, but deep enough that you can't see the bottom. The glassy surface almost looks frozen. So does Maneha. She stands rooted in place, staring at you it. You know, I thought it'd be bigger. Looks steep anyway. Gift bearers say the heaviest regrets and greatest sorrows get left here. So it better be. What are you waiting for? Uh... Maneha makes a little noise of frustration in the back of her throat. You know how when you've been thinking about something so long, you're worried that when you finally get it, it won't be what you expected? I mean, for all we know, that thing's just filled with leeches. You're stalling. Don't remind me. The problem has never been your memory. It's the part of your soul that led you to massacre those people. She closes her eyes and shakes her head furiously. But it's the memory that haunts me. I just want peace. I just want to close my eyes for once and see nothing in the dark. You can erase the memory, but that doesn't mean you'll find peace. She considers this with a furrowed brow and gritted teeth. At last, she shakes her head. Maybe not. But it's worth a try. <sighs> she lets out a long, slow breath. <sighs> okay. Here goes. She shakes her arms and legs out with a jingling of metal. Striding forward, she steps into the pool. Oh, that's cold! She convulses with a sudden shiver, rattling her jewelry. She descends the steps until she's standing in water up to her neck. Do you feel anything? I think I'm going numb, actually. This is the right pool, isn't it? Don't look at me. Yeah, yeah. Just promise me we'll get a warm drink when... She freezes for a second, her eyes wide. Then she snaps her fingers. I've got it! She digs through her pack and produces a thick bundle of cloth bound with leather. It's the same bundle you glipsed earlier. She snaps the leather cord and unrolls the cloth, revealing a wine bottle. Took this from the Marchezzo cellar the night I awakened. Been saving it for a special occasion. Maneha cradles the bottle and brushes dust from the green glass. Heaving a sigh, she swings it by the neck and smashes it against the steps. Say nothing. Maneha drops the rest of the bottle, broken bottle into the pool, where it spirals into the depths. Meanwhile, the wine has formed a roiling, bloody cloud in the water. It spreads in long, swirling tendrils. The surface of the pool ripples, and Maneha paddles at the spreading cloud. Crimson tentacles erupt from it, writhing and reaching. Maneha gasps as one wraps around her arm. Hey, she's in trouble! Get out, Maneha. Another wine-colored tentacle wraps around her head. She shouts as it pulls her under. Maneha disappears into the pool. You can't see anything through the crimson murk. Except for the boss being thought of wine, the waters look perfectly still again. The seconds crawl by. Where did that thing come from? At last, bubbles break the surface. <gasps> Maneha emerges, gasping and shivering. Her face is strangely slack, and her eyes are bloodshot. What just happened? <laughs> she blinks out the cloudy water and laughs quietly. Uh, I forgot. <laughs> Maneha climbs up the steps and out of the salt well. As she does, the reddish color dissipates from the water, even on the glassy, clear surface in the unfathomable depths below. What do you remember? She sprints, thinking. Water pools at her feet. I remember running, but I don't remember what chased me. And I remember fear, but I don't remember what scared me. She looks back at the salt well. And I gave something up, but I don't remember why. I'm not sure this is what you had in mind. Me neither. She tilts her head to one side and wiggles a finger in her ear until a spurt of water streams out. But... It feels like an improvement. Something drips onto the floor. She holds her right arm up and looks at the trickle of blood running from a cut in her hand. She takes the photocloth, the one she wrapped the wine bottle in, from the floor and staunches the bleeding. 
and I have powers granted a clean conscience. She directs her head towards the exit. Ooh. Lead the way. And that got her and Sagani a level. So let's see here. Only four can take that. It's going to be a mechanics. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So let's roll our d8 12. That is a one. Ah, she gets frenzy. Sends the barbarian into a frenzy state, granting a might constitution attack speed bonus but causing a deflection penalty against incoming attacks. While the barbarian's frenzy is active, his or her endurance and health are concealed. So it's it's rage. Might as well look at what clear conscience. Plus two to dexterity, apparently. Yep, just plus two to dex. That's level Sagani. Okay, only four of those can take the six. And it's going to be survival. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So I'll roll that d12 once more. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Master's Call. Calls the ranger's animal companion to his or her side, causing the companion to move back to the ranger at increased speed, ignoring engagement and knocking any enemies in the way prone. Three per rest. Hey. Ready when you are. And might as well look how close are we to... Okay, getting fairly close to level 14. Hey. Okay, so now we're going to tool around the monastery a bit, collect some info. This is the record? Yes. See that it is cast away with the others. The sea and her love? The sea beheld her love shining bright from on high. She bade him come down from his place in the sky. Her love could not be swayed, so he, she took a piece into her heart, and all who saw her grief that day sleep in her bosom still. Abaddon's hands. As I read this, of all the stories of all the gods, no doubt one of the most charming is the legend of Abaddon's hands. In some cultures, Abaddon's hands are tiny, cheerful creatures that hide in the walls and in the cracks between paving stones. In others, they are silent men of stone who roam distant lands. In all such tales, however, they are Abaddon's constructs, built in his image to continue his good work of creating strong and wondrous things in this world. Thus, upon spying a mighty mountain peak, or a row of outer pillars, or another natural marvel, parents and nursemaids will tell young children that those are the works of Abaddon's hands. Such is the appeal of Abaddon as a deity, as it is through his legend that we recognize familiar shapes in the natural world. Thus, when we see a landform that resembles a colonnade, or an arched gate, or a mighty home, we see a hand and a purpose at work that is not unlike our own. And while Abaddon's own identity as a construct is alienating to some, to many of us, his crude yet practical shape is comforting. While the other gods take the form of birds, beasts, and sea, Abaddon takes the shapes of our most common tools and constructions. His debasement in a body of iron elevates our own works and labors, and it offers us a grand hope, for if a god could rebuild himself out of iron, what wonders might Kith create with their own hands? Selected corresponds with gift bear Aiden, sing o ocean waves of Andra's sorrow, of her unrequited love for the unattainable moon. Sing of the ocean's sorrow, so that we may forget our own. Each day the tides reenact Andra's longing of the great moon. The waters reach out at high tide, yearning for the heavenly body, only to slump into low tide when the moon proves unattainable. You asked me once why I loved Andra so dearly, how I could go from a life on dry land to being a devotee of the goddess of the oceans. I sing of the ocean's sorrows so that I may forget my own. It is Andra's message that speaks to my heart. I have devoted my life to helping others discard painful memories, so that, for that is the gift Andra gave me. When I lost my young daughter, my wife and I were inconsolable until a gift bearer offered to take my daughter's toys and cast them into the deepest waters. 
Truth be told, I and the other gift bearers I know have never spoken to Andra. She is largely silent, and when she does speak, she uses floods and tidal waves instead of words. But we sing of the ocean's sorrow so that others may forget theirs. Andra's story, the story of desire unanswered, actually matters to people like you and me. Malgren cannot steer you to victory over sadness. Hylia cannot force joy down a crying throat. Only Andra can give us the strength to preserve when life seems without worth. And that is the answer to your question regarding why I love my goddess so dearly. Gift Bear's Pilgrimage. Hey. Um, that did something. Okay, so that actually is one side read. Okay. I'll read that before speaking to Kato again. So it's fresh in my mind. A long time ago that was. Saw the abbot holding the witness, and the veil of tears parted for him. Okay, let's head back down. There's the mural out here that we do want to get a look at. Let's head on over here, see what else we can find. Even with your labors, your presence of mind never falters. I don't know how you do it. Perhaps your thoughts would swim deeper if your tongue didn't come out for air so often, dear brother. Okay, then. The High Abbot imparted to me that I wasn't alone. That he has nightmares sometimes as well. Truly? I never knew. Oh, Did you hide in the White March after that? such a peaceful man. As far away as I could. The Dominels didn't care I was a gift bearer. Evidence is evidence. Okay, let's check the ramparts of the abbey then. Okay, this is the mural. The mural is rendered on the face of the rock wall. Four panels seem to be arranged in a story of some kind. Inspect the mural. First panel, Anthu, the end. Second panel, Saman, the flood. Third panel, Disaman, the ebb. Fourth panel, Dianthu, the beginning. Okay. 
and let's check the rest of the exterior of the abbey. You look pale, sister. Find someone to take your place. I'll stand watch. I had hoped I was over this illness, but clearly not. I shall take your advice. Even our visitor is to be turned away, he said. What interest would our quarters hold? Our quarters aren't the worry. It's our brothers and sisters below. See if we can find some gift bearers. Hmm, that's actually not bad. You must gather your. This is from. I'll be going then. Let's see what's over here. I should not have peered over the edge. I could see no bottom. Ha! Huh. Perhaps if you pray, the lady will allow you to forget. Okay, and this is just another way... in. So head back in. I think this is just the payday, yeah. Oh, I had to seize there. Okay, let's see if we can find any gift bearers specifically to talk to. I'll tinker with that. Yep. What could go wrong? Oh, here's a gift bearer. The gift bearer holds up, holds in her hand a gem the size of a fist. She draws a curved line in the air over it, then tosses it into the water. As the gem hits the water, it disappears from sight, as though it has been dissolved. Greetings. What happened to that gem? What gem? The gem you tossed into the pond. I remember no gem. 
You tossed in. How could you have forgotten? This pool's best by Andre Typinker. Uh, never mind. So I'm not willing to see if uh, Clarence goes cray cray and attacks, simply because uh, at this point they are still trying to uh, infiltrate. So let's read that book. Okay, let me take a look see here. A gift pair of Andres traveling along the road when she meets a man tears holding a scrap of parchment. Why do you weep? asks the gift bearer. I hold here a letter from my wife. I tried to be a good husband, but the letter says that I was not, and she has gone to seek the company of a better man. Now this, this is all that remains of her. Give the letter to me, you then, says the gift bearer. For once you have got forgotten the letter, your wife can cause you no further pain. The man gives her the letter and finds his tears have dried up. He thanks the gift bearer and lives in, at peace. The gift bearer continues on, contemplating the man's story, but does not get far before she encounters an old woman in tears holding a string of beads. Why do you weep? asks the gift bearer. I am I hold here a string of beads that counter the years of my daughter's life. Sickness took her when she was still a child, and she was denied the joys of a full life, and I the joys of a mother. That is all that remains of her. Give the beads to me then, says the gift bearer. For once you have forgotten the beads, your daughter can truly rest. The old woman gives her the beads and finds her grief no longer gnaws at her soul. She thanks the gift bearer and leaves at peace. Thinking of the woman's pain, the gift bearer follows, follows the road until she reaches the sea. In her hand, she carries the letter and the beads. They are light in her hands, but heavy upon her heart, and she is crying. She prays to Andre to allow the objects to be forgotten and cast them into the water. And yet, long after they have sunk beneath the waves, the gift bearer finds herself still weeping. Merciful Andra, pleads the gift bearer, in your service I have helped people forget their troubles, yet though I pass them on to you, I feel them still as though they were mine. How can this be? The gift bearer listens to the wisdom of the crashing waves until she understands. To feel the troubles of others in your soul is to burden itself. However, she has no token to give Andra to bear it away. For the troubles are not hers to forget. I give myself to you then, says the gift bearer, for once I am in your care, no memory may haunt me. And with that, the tide comes forth and embraces the gift bearer, and with its ebb, she is gone. Hey. Okay, so I think we're ready to start that recitation with Kato. Give me just one moment, I'm gonna go take care of something, I'll be right back. Alright, I'm back, and I have a Dr. Pepper. 
Yeah, okay, Are you okay. prepared now for the recitation? About the recitation. <laughs> you seem nervous. <laughs> the Conclave chose you for a reason. For a devout follower of Andra, the answers will flow naturally to you. I remember my own rising. The Conclave sent me on the same exhausting journey. When it came time for the recitation, I could not remember a word. But it all came back in time. Our goddess smiles upon the forgetful. He taps a large golden ring with a rave insignia as though it were proof. Our library is open to you, as are the grounds outside. There is a beautiful mural out there that you should see, if you haven't yet. And you may, of course, speak with the gift bearers. Take your time and examine these things before your recitation. I understand, High Abbot. I know you will not disappoint when the time comes. The Conclave mentioned something about a reliquary? Yes, of course. I would not pass my station to you without passing that knowledge as well. It is the Abbey's most sacred chamber. When the rising is complete, I will take you there myself. In fact, the ritual demands it. We can begin the recitation. Very good. We shall commence the rising. First is Anthu. Last is Dianthu. For the tide comes at the end and leaves at the beginning. I am Disaman the Ebb. Who comes this way? I am Saman the Flood. Blessed be Saman that washes over the shore and brings the end. Blessed be Disaman that returns to the sea and leaves behind the beginning. A gift bearer comes to Disaman and asks him to bear his burdens away. What token do you offer, gift bearer? I offer myself, for gift bearer has no other tokens to offer. The token is received in Andra's name. Tell me of your burdens. I have none, for that all belongs to Andra is forgotten. In Andra's embrace, our burdens are lifted. Cato appears pleased. He nods. Meneha sighs with relief. The Tidebringer shows himself worthy of his charge. Your purpose here, Tidebringer, is to perform the ceremony of the Rising. It is the transition of one phase of service to the next. On the level beneath us in the Halls of Silence, our Low Tide brothers and sisters have lived for many years, sealed by their own will. It is time for them to be relieved of service, and for the High Tide brothers and sisters here to take their place. In the halls below, you will find a relic, Andra's witness, and a spurgulum for dispensing holy water, but also something more. It is set into a device it operates atop a flight of steps. The device will flood the halls of silence. This is the rising. I will return once the rising is complete. To reach your destination, you will need to know the sign of the tide, which is kept only by the High Abbot. It's said that it is the first knowledge lost when the Abbot joins the low tide in the halls of silence. Watch carefully. Cato contorts his fingers on his right hand in a particular curl shape. Then with his left hand, he traces an arc from center to end, simultaneously with his index and little fingers. I trust you will perform your duty, Tidebringer. Hey. Okay. So now we head to... Halls of Silence. This area is forbidden. Cato granted me leave to walk freely. So it begins. You may continue, Tidebringer. Be warned. The low tide have been in the halls of science for a long time. Their minds are not sound. Your presence may provoke them. I'll tinker with that. What can All go done. wrong? Let's turn fast mode off. Okay. 
Make sure they receive extra. I'll not let them fall into the goddess's embrace with empty stomachs. Their supplies are bountiful, sister. I have seen to it. I have crested key. Stew. Mm, stew. Let's keep exploring this way. Mind your center. There. You always knew this time would come. I've seen the other side, brother. I'll find its waters again. Warm and soothing. Actually, let's explore the rest of the floor real quick. Why not? This massive coppery bones encased under the ice seem to be part of the hips of a giant skeleton. Actually, we'll use that ring for a maneha. Because they're just good in general. More pluses. I think there's some moon spiders here. Yep. Brave does the Lord believe. Specifically, have Need something? her obvious kill it just to get another kill on its staff. Or, oh, God, it did not affect you to death. Okay. I think her obvious needs like one more kill. Yeah. And then I believe the staff reaches its final level. When things come along nicely, I probably won't do anything with these, to be honest. Hey. Oh, body. Dagger and some lock picks. Yeah. And this is how you could actually enter elsewise. Sorry about that. Sinuses have been going at me tonight. Let's check out the soul. Hovering over a skeleton tra half trapped in ice, a faint trace of trace of essence lingers in the cold air of the cavern. Reach out to the essence. 
You let your soul envelop the essence. Memories spread in a thin mist under you, dim and torn. There are scattered fragments floating like motes of dust in the twilight. You're walking into an oblong chamber. The stones and the underground walls glisten, still wet from the floodwaters. A hand glasps on your shoulders. You hear whispers. Are thick, I don't want to look. The memory vanishes, and now all you see is a slab of stone. You are staring at it just inches away from the wall. Your fingers trace circles on it, digging into the moss that clings on its weathered surface. You're not sure how long you've been touching. Perhaps you've always been. A scream jolts you. It echoes thunder through the halls. Your ears start a pain that digs deep, burrowing into your head like a twisted dagger. You run, others run. You don't know them, you can't remember them, but somehow you take comfort in their presence. Yes, they can help you with the pain, the noise, you'll kill it. The anger of the memory subsides, and now you're sitting down on steps carved on rock. Dozens of skeletons lie below, beneath frozen water. The jaws hang open, silent. Yet what's that? A low rumble, gargling, growing, deafening. You snap your head to the side in anguish and see it, the water rushing down the halls, pushing you in a torrent of right foam. You fall, your mouth open to shut, but your screams are muffled as it fills with water. The door is sealed shut. Yeah, they don't like that sound. And it makes them go aggro. Yeah, have her obviously. It's lightning. to herself here. No. Or not. Ugh, fucking mucks. Where was Haravius? Petrification did nothing. Let's do Terran's Chaotic Bolt instead. See if that did anything. Ravix's is back up. Let's have him heal. Kitty Gap. Yeah, take this priest. Take this monk. This weapon is good to me. Let's just focus our fire. This one is no good to me. Hey. Adair, take okay. him out. I said it. I think Adair is down. Scanning so shit. Oh, so <sighs> <Come on, laughs> hey. Ooh, twin stink. Okay, so now Twin Stink is superb and grants Fright and Non-Kill in addition to all of his other stuff. Such was the embarrassment to the poison skill that Girthrock was nearly cast out. 
But Girthrox's promise, but the leadership knew that Girthrox's promise was great. They had built for him a custom crossbow capable of firing two bolts with a single shot, that he might never make the same mistake twice. Hey. Hey. Let time heal their endurance up. Quick save and continue on. Here's a side of Andra I've never heard I of. shall be quiet as a calm sea. Who's Which there? Not very quiet. Tufts of downy gray hair sprout from the back of this man's scalp like shrubs. His lower lip curls inward of a row of teeth that appear to have mostly fallen out, and a musty odor hangs around him like a fog. Is that you, Edith? I... I thought I'd lost you. I called for you. I wanted to search, but the blizzard lasted days. I'm... I'm so sorry. He extends a hand in a gesture of apology, but then the fingers curl and he draws it back. He squints, as if trying to see you better. But wait. We did find you. When the thaw finally came, I saw you rigid, frozen. You cannot be, Edith. No, we are in, in the Abbey. Gift bearers, and you, you must be the tide bringer. Correct. I am the tide bringer. Then listen well, tide bringer. Kauto does not know what he asks, nor did I, when I performed the tide bringer's duties so long ago. The halls of silence. They take our minds, memory by memory. It would be peaceful, we were told, like going to sleep. Look around you. We, the low tide, who have been sealed down here all these many years, do we seem at peace to you? We are lost, terrified. What is it you want from me? There is a... a relic, an aspergillum. It was called. What was it? Well, it doesn't matter. It controls the floodwaters. But also the outer floodgates. Andra's Witness. That is the name. It is down here, but I don't recall how to reach it. The High Abbot knows. If you can find out from him, you could set us free. Open the gates. We would leave in peace and finish our lives in dignity. I'll see what I can do. Use the door behind me. Safer that way. Okay, so he gives you a key. Quick and quiet. An acrid and pungent smell climbs up from the depths of the pit. Okay, we'll take this one off just as a wonder. Hey. 
hired, I'd pay brothel rates just to nap. <laughs> Wicked quiet. I'm here. Back, back, back. This is here. All right, then. Okay, different scenes of the ocean shoreline are carved into four stone panels, arranged almost haphazardly at different heights along a network of rails. Inspect the panels. The panels are affixed to a set of rails that curve and crisscross in patterns that remind you of seaweed. There are four depressions in the walls behind the rails, in which the panels look like they would fit. The panels show variously a barren shore, a city in flames, a flourishing city, and a tidal wave. Arrange the panels. It appears that any panel can be slid into any depression by following the network of rails. Move which panel to the first empty depression? Slide the panel of the city in flames. You grab the panel and slide it on the rails into the first available opening. Once the panel matches the recess of the wall, you gently press on it. It slides without resistance and locks into place. Uh, move which panel to the first... Empty depression. Uh, then we're gonna go the tidal wave. Then we're gonna go the barren shore. And then we're gonna go the flourishing city. The remaining panels retract and lock into place. Behind the heavy stones, there is a metallic ground and a steady roar. A small tile about waist high slides back. Beneath there is a carving. It shows an image of an ocean wave curled around a crescent moon, performing the side of the tide on the hidden carving. You will curl your hand as Cato had done, in motion on it, oh, in position over the curving of the wave. Then, using the other hand, you trace the arc of the crescent with your index and little fingers. A heavy rumble stirs the ground, and from all around you comes the s sound of rushing water. Embedded in the steep semicircular slab is what looks to be a vessel for sprinkling of holy water. In this context, however, it looks more like a lever. The image is engraved on the wall behind it. One of a rising wave, one of an open gate. Point the object toward the rising wave. A faint trickle of water is audible at the edge of your hearing. It grows steadily into a roaring torrent. Human voices echo through stone halls, pleading, gurgling, screaming, and then silence. That is what forgiveness sounds like, screaming and then silence. With a click, the machine releases its hold on the strange rod. You pack the vessel away. May Andra's tides wash them to peaceful shores.
bit some bodies. Let's go meet Kato up at the reliquary. I'll see if he's here, or and if not, we'll just head up to the relic ring. Okay. Is it done then? It is done. And do I know what it is to use that relic to call the flood? Even though it is necessary, even though it is merciful, it will stay with you. Always. One day, it will be a new Tidebringer's turn to call the Flood, when I am down there. And then another for you. Only then will we be free of it. Free of the memory. He nods and puts a hand on your shoulder. The touch is tentative, and he withdraws his hand almost immediately. Come, meet me upstairs outside the reliquary. There is one more thing to be done to complete the Rising. Hey. Come on, folks. The Veil of Tears is only to be crossed by the High Abbot. Andra's witness is the key. Through the Veil is the Reliquary. When we are done here, pass into the Reliquary, and your responsibilities will be revealed to you. The final step of the Rising requires that you use Andra's witness to seal me below with my brothers and sisters. Uh, forgive me. The Rising. The final step. <clears throat> A slight correction. You will not be sealing us in the halls of silence. The other Andrides look at each other with furrowed brows. What? After all that? The only way I will allow you to become the High Abbot is if you can kill me and those who stand with me here and now. That wasn't what you said earlier. I have made up my mind. Have you ever swum in the open ocean, Tidebringer? I don't see what this has to do with anything. When you swim in the ocean, you are at the mercy of the current and the waves. It requires a great deal of trust. When I was a young man in Rawatai, I would paddle out in a small kayak and go spearfishing in the gulf. One day, when I was swimming, I was caught in a rip current and pulled miles from my boat. I stayed afloat long as I could, but there was no getting to safety. It was night, and the water was black. 
I took a final breath and sunk below the surface. Then there came a glow beneath me. It was a moon ray the size of a caravel, if you can imagine such a creature. I saw it swimming up toward me, and even as things began to grow dark around me, I knew I was safe. Are you going somewhere with us? I awoke on shore. That day, I pledged myself to Andra, because I knew she had seen me safely through, and that she always would. The glow of that moon ray has always been a beacon in my life. If I am sealed beneath, I will be forced to part with it, and a thousand other memories that make me what I am. I will die. Afraid and alone. What about everything you said? About trusting Andra, surrendering your memories to her? I thought I would be ready. My trust in Andra was absolute. But I am weaker than I imagined. I will defeat you and stay on as High Abbot. Or I will die here, knowing who I am. Either would be better. All right. <laughs> oh, dice. I've heard enough. Okay. This is actually one of the harder fights, if I remember correctly. Start off with an orb. Some lightning. Just have her uh, frenzy off the bat. Sorry, Dr. Pepper Burp. Bring in some gaze of the R Dragon. Try to focus them down as quickly as possible. Good, yes. Take that kill, kill faster. Get another gaze prepped while I'm still going. Petrification, <laughs> more killing. He's the lowest, so just take him out. Focus on Kato again. Heravius. Hear your ding ding self. Uh, to call to slumber. Come on, kill Kato. 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 Your res. Do that. Do that. More lightning. Yeah. Missiles. Kitty cat. <sighs> Unaccountably, the duplicates are allowed to live, even though Kata is dead.
So this time we're just going to focus Kato, hopefully bring him down before he can bring his out his duplicates, which survive past his death, because why not? Not okay. really? Right here. The veil of through the fight. Uh, <clears throat> the only way I will allow you to become the high. Have you ever swum in the open ocean? When I wonder, I stay the same thing as swimming, swimming up toward me. I the glow. I will. What? A I, I will defeat you, and stay on as. Potentially, there's a way to make that fight easier, but well, that's not what the dice decide for us. Everyone. Okay, good, he's down. Now everyone else. They're obvious to your heel. The gaze of the Audragon. Petrify dude out. Oh, wonderful. Come on, just a bit more, folks. There we go. Kana, do your resurrection on her. Yes. Wonderful. Just focus fire, folks. Focus fire. Go, go, go. God, just kill them! There we go. Dare heal. I'm here. Take you out. So take you out. Fuck on, people. Just get him. Oh my god. Come on. Fucking attack. Oh my god. Come the fuck on. Hit him. Probably should use that beforehand, but I will. There we go. Flank. Someone just killed this little shit. It's 68% chance. Come on, kill him. Okay, Marif. 
Maybe I'll finish this off. Better fucking finish this off. Get up. Get up! Six goddamn seconds. Oh my fucking god. Now kill him. There we go. I'm starting to slow the pack. Can we sit for a spell and relax? Hey. Okay, okay. So basically beyond okay, we did get some level ups. Let's use that. Die. That's lower. That's going to be substantial phantom. Which uh, creates a duplicate that can just create low, cast low level spells. Talents. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So roll the d20. Five, but in a second level spell. Okay. We also got Heravius. That's also a lore. Talents. Defensive. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Five. One, two, three, four, five. Mental Fortress. Plus 10 defense against charms, terrified, frightened, dominated, and confused. Okay, so beyond hey. this point is a conversation and then heading to a new map, which is the end game for uh, White March 2. I'm actually going to call the stream here because my sinuses are giving me a extra hard time tonight for some reason. Uh, and it's just uh, horrible. But we got through one of... What is... Honestly, my mind always one of the just most troublesome fights in this game. So, I'm going to put in a save here. And there are ways to make it easier. Like, you can, like, turn his allies against him and stuff like that, which really does help. But, you know, the dice decided we were going to do this the hard way. So, anyways, I did enjoy your stopping by. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh... Despite all of my sinuses and some of the uh, yelling at the folks to just get on with it at the end there. But, you know, in any uh, non-action skill game, I feel that's always a thing where, like, stop XCOMing me, just, just roll and hit. Roll and hit. But they did. They did in the end, and I didn't have to do that battle a third time, so I'm very happy. But anyways, uh, next time I will be streaming uh, Persona 4 Golden, where we finished uh, the Kanji arc, and we'll be just streaming till we can get to the beginning of the Rize arc. Rize arc, I should say. I'm going from there. So hope to see you then. Hope you have a fantastic night, and have a great weekend now. Bye-bye now, folks. And of course, all my VOD will be up on uh, Ambiguous Influence YouTube channel, as always. Okay. Good night, and have a good weekend. Bye-bye.